thank the wildlife and nature protection society for giving me an opportunity to speak to you about something that is extremely important to conservation in sri lanka the role that civil society can play in conservation generally conservation is driven by governments but if there is a problem in the government driving conservation we may either have to give up saying that there is no conservation or conservation is not happening properly in the country or we as civil society and civil society organizations can try to play a role in changing the course of the government's program so i would like to start off by focusing on biodiversity in sri lanka to see how we are performing up to now sri lanka has the highest biodiversity per unit area in asia and therefore we are considered a global biodiversity hotspot it's a hotspot because biodiversity is threatened biodiversity influences ecosystem services that is the benefits provided by ecosystems to humans that contributing that contribute to making human life both possible and worth living if biodiversity contributes to ecosystems to uplift human life i think conservation of biodiversity should be a key development objective of governments unfortunately in most instances lip service is paid to conservation but actual in actuality very little happens so let's look at how we rate biodiversity conservation in this country and I, now i'm quoting from the iucn red list in 2000, which was done in 2007 33% of sri lanka's inland vertebrate fauna and 61% of its flora are threatened around 33% of the th threatened biodiversity is endemic to sri lanka 21 species of endemic amphibians have not been recorded during the past 100 years and these species could therefore for most purposes be considered extinct one in one in every 12 species of sri lanka's inland indigenous vertebrates is currently facing an immediate or extremely high risk of extinction in the wild and this is a very important thing almost one in 12 species are facing extinction in the wild and experts suggest that unless this trend this trend will continue unless more systematic and stringent corrective measures are taken so what is our scorecard efforts in conservation are weak at best obviously based on the data in the iuc and red list one of the critical factors for this is weak gov wildlife governance government rhetoric on conservation is strong but actions do not match the rhetoric and i would like to qualify when i talk about government i am not talking about this government or that government governments over the last 30 years have been responsible for this little or no corrective measures have been taken even after the 2007 red listing i don't really see serious measures have that have been taken by government to try to deal with the problem so if government is not doing it maybe we as civil society should at least try to figure out how we can change this trend if not the biodiversity and the wildlife that, that we all cherish may not be there for future generations of this country let's see who is driving the wildlife conservation agenda in sri lanka and here i am i highlighted the word conservation is red because i am not asking the question who is driving the wildlife agenda there are plenty of people driving the wildlife agenda for different vested interests my question is who is driving the wildlife conservation agenda in this country according to the mandate given under the fauna and flora protection ordinance this responsibility lies with the department of wildlife conservation i was either too idealistic or too stupid to believe that by becoming director general of wildlife i can actually change the course of conservation in this country unfortunately that is not the case it is not the case not because the wildlife conservation department is not interested the department has problems no doubt but given the right conditions the department actually can do some work the department is committed the department is dedicated to do that unfortunately the department is 
has now been relegated to carrying out instructions from ministries and political authorities, not actually getting involved in doing conservation work. They're just carrying out instructions. And so the department obviously can't drive the agenda if that is their situation. The political authorities and the ministry in charge of wildlife. And again, I would like to qualify that when I talk about political authorities, I'm not talking about individuals. I'm talking about a system that is failing. The system really, I would say, is dysfunctional. And I'm talking about a dysfunctional system that has occurred over the last 30 years. So it is not specific individuals responsible for it, but it is a systemic problem that goes beyond the wildlife sector as well. The political authorities and the ministry, their mandate really is to give policy direction to the department and do monitoring and evaluation to see whether the department actually achieves their objectives. Unfortunately, the political authorities and the ministries today, not only in the wildlife sector but in other sectors as well, not only do they give policy direction, they give implementation direction, they give technical direction on what needs to be done. Leaving the agencies that are responsible for doing it, mere servants carrying out orders. And if that is what is going to happen, we are in serious trouble because the political time horizon is six years before the next election. So no politician is going to look at benefits that will accrue to the country 30 years down the road, 20 years down the road. It has no bearing on them. What should be done to reap some benefits over the next six years is what the focus is on. That is why it is difficult to do wildlife conservation in that way. Because conservation is long-term involvement. We have other stakeholders that I have listed here, the private sector, civil society, led by environmental and NG wildlife conservation NGOs, the media and local communities as stakeholders. Generally in a sector, most likely one person takes the lead, supported by all the other stakeholders who have a role to play. I feel in this country, we don't have a person taking the lead at this point. And I'm hoping that I can convince you during my lecture that maybe we as civil society have to start taking the lead in supporting the Wildlife Conservation Department in achieving its mandate. Let's look at the protected area network, which, is the, which are the havens for wildlife in this country. The focus on protected, on protected areas should be for number one, conservation, number two, protection, and number three, tourism. Unfortunately, we have got it all wrong. We focus on tourism first, tourism second, tourism third. There is a little bit of protection going on and almost no conservation going on. Because we think this is a cash cow, the wildlife tourism industry, so we, let's milk it for all it's worth. Without realizing if we continue on that line, in the long term, there will be no resources in this country for us to generate revenue for. There are a couple of major conservation issues of significance that I would like to raise with you. These are still at the very early stages of discussion in government. Fortunately, I had a seat at the table in some of these discussions and I'm very nervous with what is being proposed and I would like to discuss it with you so that we have to get mobilized as civil society to try to prevent detrimental things from happening to our wildlife. <coughs> We are all familiar with the phenomenon of the elephant gathering in Mineria. Not only is it a nationally recognized event, internationally too, Lonely Planet identified the gathering at Mineria as one of the 10 wildlife wonders of the world. And that is the only wildlife wonder from Sri Lanka that is on that list of 10. Then we also have people like uh, Mr. Srilal Mithapala, who had done a back of the envelope calculation on tourism revenue, direct and indirect tourism revenue, as a result of the Mineria gathering. And that is in the range of $1.25 billion, not million. Right. So here we have an asset of elephants that the country is 
benefiting economically to the tune of 1.25 billion dollars but the government has a plan of diverting more water to min area reservoir so that min area can serve as a feeder or a storage tank or a stock tank for kaudulla and kantale which means so that those tanks will have water year round to do that min area has to be at spill level if min area is at spill level most of the grasslands that are going to that are exposed right now during the dry season will be submerged in water and while lot of people feel that elephants come to min area because of the water they are really coming for the fodder for the grasslands that emerge when the water recedes so if the grasslands are going to be covered may not be 100% covered but large portion of the grasslands are going to be covered there is not enough food for the elephants who depend on this grasslands for at least 5 months of the year in the short term this will result in increased human elephant conflict in the area but in the long term the conservation future of this 3 to 400 elephants is in serious jeopardy and no irrigation project or agricultural project will earn anywhere close to the 1.25 billion dollars that is being earned from tourism so one wonders why we are doing this but this discussion is ongoing right now at the very early stages eias or nothing has been done so i think we need to get mobilized to try to prevent this from happening the second thing is another irrigation project piping irrigation water through two 4 meter wide pipes which will be buried underground through the co conservation area of waskamo national park while it may be buried the argument is it's going to be buried so there is not going to be an impact but the construction to, could take at least 2 years and during the construction period we might do irreversible damage to the wildlife in waskamo national park so this is also something that is under discussion and we have to be aware of and try to deal with it while the wildlife conservation department has a mandate to try to say no to these things let's be practical the minister of mahavali development is his, his excellency the president so it is a huge challenge for the department to object to it that is where civil society can play a role by trying to raise concerns about it in a timely manner not wait till it's all over to object to it and in fact we have to be fair this government is much more uh, receptive to civil society pressure so we might be able to do something to stop this if you look at further conservation issues in protected areas do we have any idea of the wildlife populations in our protected areas the trends is the population going up or is it going down we have done almost no studies on that so we have absolutely no or very little idea of what's going on there is some anecdotal evidence dr prithviraj fernando and his group the center for conservation and research will very easily say that the elephant population in yala has drastically reduced that i think any one of us who has been going to yala for more than 20 years if you think back 20 years ago when you went to yala the number of elephants you saw and the number of elephants you see when you go into yala today you will realize that there is a problem there are days i spend a lot of time in yala there are days that i spend 8 hours in the park and i can't see one elephant what has happened to all the elephants the elephant population in yala has reduced because the department at the insistence of political pressure erected the electric fence at the boundary of yala and southern boundary of yala national park the southern boundary is the buffer zone of the southern boundary is forest department land which is protected areas so there was no if the forest department land is protected from human habitation there is no reason why we should prevent elephants from coming out to forest department lands as well and dr prithviraj fernando i know for a fact spoke about this to the wildlife department in 2004 before the fence was being erected appealing to them not to do this telling them if you do this the you are going to take away the dry season home range 
of the elephants and they will not have enough food during the dry season inside Yala. And the population, like I said, will happen in Min area. It might decimate the elephant population in Yala. There were some meetings that I, I too joined with him. Obviously, we have been very effective because the fence was erected. Right? So, actually, we tend to blame the wildlife department for everything. There are certain aspects that they should need to be blamed as well. But it is political pressure that forced them to do things like this. Another issue is the leopards. We are very happy that and very proud to say that Yala has the highest density of leopards in the world. Has anybody studied the prey population? Because the long term survival of the leopards will depend on the prey. There is a lot of poaching going on. Nobody has any idea of the prey population. So very soon if the prey reduces, the leopards will reduce. There is nothing that we are doing on that. Unfortunately, while there are these serious conservation issues to be addressed, that is not what we are addressing. Above the department, and I don't want to mention names, but above the department, when I was the DG, I got an instruction of a technical, and I'll give you that example, of a technical intervention in conservation. I was told that because elephants don't have enough fodder in national parks, let's start growing fruits, vegetables and grain inside Vilpattu as a forest art, so that they will have enough food, then they don't need to go into the chainas. Right? So I had to very firmly remind the people who told me, Vilpattu is not a chaina land, it's a national park which is high in biodiversity and we should not be tampering with things like this. But I managed to stop it at that time, but I don't know what will happen in the future, so we have to be a bit careful of that type of thing as well. And it might happen in other national parks also. Now let's look at some of the protection issues. I am now going to say a few things that is more internal to the wildlife department and maybe we can't, we as a civil society can't do anything about it, but I, I would like to raise it to you so that you understand the constraints that the wildlife department is going through. We all know that urgent need, there is an urgent need to increase efforts in patrolling of protected areas to prevent poaching. But why isn't this happening? If you ask anybody, they will say from the department or the ministry, they would say we have in, in, inadequate staff. In fact, that was the answer that I also got. I agree. We need more staff. I'm sorry, I, my wife told me, don't say we because you're no longer DG Wildlife. <laughs> right? The department needs more staff. I agree. But is it only a lack of staff that is doing it or are we not deploying the existing staff properly? So I checked in the department when I was there whether we have a deployment plan for staff. The department has a deployment plan which identifies the number of staff, the ranks, who should be in every assistant director's office, park warden's office, ranger's office, beat office, everywhere. So I thought, oh, that's great. So we have a plan. Now, can I see the actual deployments of staff? There is no relationship between the plan and actual deployments. And I asked them why. The reason, at least within the department, there are certain systems in place. There is a transfer board annually who look at transfers. Once the transfer board makes the transfers, there's an appeals committee that people who are dissatisfied with the transfer they got can come and appeal. And after that, things should work. Unfortunately, that is not what happens. To be honest, the transfer board works well. The appeals committee is reasonably good. The fun and games begin after that. That is when all politicians start calling the director general, not only the minister in charge of the subject, but all politicians from different areas of the country, putting pressure that A should be transferred to a location B, the next person should be transferred somewhere else, and once that is all done, you end up with the actual deployment. And our actual deployment is so intelligent that a very large number of wildlife officials is in the western region. The country has been divided wildlife-wise to 12 regions. The West, why do we need so many staff in the western region? We have huge wildlife problems. We have Horogola National Park, which is about a 50-acre park. 
and we have Hikadua Marine Sanctuary, where we do almost no patrolling. But the largest number of staff is here. Why? It's close to Colombo, it's close to urban centers, and people like to go there. So political pressure is put on the department and on the DG to make these transfers. In fairness, now you might wonder why does the DG make these transfers? Why can't the DG stand firm and say, I'm not going to do it? I was also one of the people who felt that because I never realized the pressure until I got into that position. Imagine yourself as a public servant who needs this job for survival for your wife and family. Can you afford to tell a politician, I'm not going to do it? Because you'll be thrown out the next day. Again, I'm not talking specific governments, I'm talking what has happened over the last 30 years. Right? So, pressure is put on this person who is seated in that chair to reverse all the decisions that have been made. That's how we end up with that. I decided when I was there that I, will, I spoke to the unions and said, okay, let's on agree on a transfer policy. And then we go through the transfer board and then we go through the appeals committee and then I will not change anything. Regardless to where the request comes, I will not make any transfers after that. Either I will go or the transfers will remain so you know what happened. Right? It was not that reason because the transfer board meets in August but there were problems. So we have a huge problem of deploying the existing staff even properly. And the reason I raised it here is not only to criticize the government for this happening. We, from the conservation community who blame the department for not doing patrolling properly, not enforcing the law, should understand the constraints they are facing because they don't have enough staff. And not having this staff, what do we do? We go and do other things that are equally uh, I wanted to say stupid, but maybe I shouldn't say that. Right? We are now opening new gates in existing national parks. New gates for more visitors to come in when we are having overcrowding problems. And when a gate is open, you have to deploy staff to that gate. They have to manage the ticket office, you have to have some trackers there. So the limited number of staff that we have in the field, now we are, we are redeploying them from the field also to visitation services. And we did a bit of an assessment to see how much revenue some of these new openings have generated. The Kaltota entrance, for an example in Udawala Way, has generated 0.5% of the revenue of Udawala Way. Now to get this 0.5%, we are redeploying staff who should be involved in patrolling. I don't think this is a sensible way for us to move forward if we seriously want to conserve wildlife in this country. Unfortunately, there were certain other disincentives for patrolling. The recent incident that happened in June in Yala, where a leopard was, the department did a raid and caught some poachers with a dead leopard and some 46 kilos of samba meat. The, there were directives to the staff of the department that they should involve the police. The department under the Fauna and Flora Protection Ordinance has the mandate to arrest people and produce them in court. The department people took that route. If the powers that be felt that that route should not have been taken, they could be reprimanded for that, not chastised for it. That is what happened to them. And today staff in the department have told me, all this has happened because we went on a patrol. If we didn't go on a patrol, nothing would have happened. So we shouldn't go on patrols. So we are dis dis disincentivizing even the patrols. Then we have this phenomenon of the Padayatra. Now Padayatra at the Katragama season is a traditional thing. People from the northeast will walk through Kumana, Yala, SNR, Block 2 to Katragama. That Traditionally, it has been happening, so I think maybe it has to go ahead. I'm not very happy about it, but I guess it has to go ahead. But about three or four years ago, we started a new thing of having dun sellers inside block two of Yala. Dun sellers. 
So I decided we are not going to have dance sellers. I spoke to the department. Department, my colleagues agreed. Maybe we shouldn't. Nobody wanted the dance sellers. I spoke to the Katragama Devale officials. They agreed that dance sellers should be stopped because that they also felt it didn't make sense. We spoke. I spoke to the secretary of the Ministry of Hindu Affairs, and he also agreed that it's fine to stop it. I spoke to the political authorities. So everything was done. We stopped the dance sellers. On the 5th of June, I was told that a senior person involved in the Dalada Perahara had said and had appealed that the dance sellers be permitted. And I was told that since you refused to give the elephants to the Perahara, we thought we'll say okay to the dance sellers. Right? Now, it was not my elephants to give, the court ordered confiscation. So, I stood by what the court said and refused to release the elephants. So, this is the type of thing that is happening. This is not conservation. And this is what we are focusing and spending our time on. If this happens on the long term, there will be no wildlife resources for future generations in this country. We have a lot of pressure not to enforce regulations. We have no pressure to enforce regulations. Right. Not to enforce regulations, we get, I was getting pressure, the department gets pressure from all sides. Right. So, it becomes a huge problem for you to try to enforce the law, which was, which was what the department is supposed to do. So, now I have criticized what is going on, now I shouldn't stop there because then you will say, what are we going to do about it? So, let's look at some solutions. How can we as the conservation community and civil society help? in conservation and protection. Effective conservation is based on good information for decision making. We are making decisions without information. We have very little scientific information to make decisions on managing the protected area network. So I would like to encourage, I know there are a lot of people in private sector here, holding big positions in private sector, you all have CSR money. Try to actually fund some studies to get information that at least we from civil society can talk in the media and compel politicians to do the right thing. WNPS has started this to start, we were discussing something just this afternoon before this meeting, to host panel discussions on controversial subjects, bringing all the players together, including the political leadership, to try to discuss issues because don't expect the wildlife department to tell a politician, sorry, I'm not going to do that, that is wrong. It's not going to happen because they need their job. Right. So at least from civil society, from NGOs, we can try to facilitate that discussion because we can do it. Then we all have good political connections, I know that. We all use most of those political connections are to do things that we want. I am making an appeal to all of us, including myself. Can we try to use those political connections to try to force the government to do something good on conservation? To, right, to do the right thing. It is absolutely necessary. And we also need to encourage better media reporting on wildlife. I remember article I saw in the paper. Elephant attacks van, one dead, five injured. So what is the image that comes in your mind? This poor van was parked on the roadside. There was an elephant came, smashed the van, killed somebody and injured five others. I checked with the assistant director. This happened in Karwal Gaswab. I checked with the assistant director in wildlife. This was after I left. What happened? Apparently this van was coming so fast, it slammed into the elephant because it couldn't stop. And another elephant attacked the vehicle. So who is, to, who is to blame for that? It is the van and the van driver, not the elephant. But the media article says elephant attacks van. Right? So there are so many articles coming out like that. So we should try to engage the media to try to be more responsible and give the wildlife point of view also. Even this recent uh, incident of the uh, Ratnapura Perahara. Except for one article, everything else gives the impression that the elephant went amok, ran, ran amok and attacked people. 
Actually, the elephant didn't touch an individual. It attacked another elephant. So, NGOs should start working with local communities. Right? We have some very good examples because of a lack of time. I'm not getting into the examples, but you can Google it and find out. Zimbabwe's campfire program is a very good program where communities and NGOs work together for protection and conservation of wildlife. Closer to home, Nepal brings in, they have a buffer zone fund because Nepal believes that the communities surrounding parks should get benefit from the park. So 35% of the revenue of the protected areas in Nepal go into the buffer zone fund for community development. So there's a direct link between the community and the park because the community money will come if visitors come to the park. So will the community engage in poaching? No, because then they will lose the revenue. Nobody is going to come to see trees. So we should start thinking of programs like that. They also have community forests. The buffer zone of a national park in Nepal is forest land managed by the community. The community is per per permitted to show, bring tourists in and show wildlife in the community forest. So they are earning revenue from tourism. So it gives them an incentive for them to want conservation. These pro so we have some good examples like that we can use. And what we should be doing is community conservation and protection initiatives, but communities should have tangible benefits for coexisting with wildlife. If, we, if the tangible benefits are not there, then the incentive for the communities to support wildlife is not there. And then things like this should happen. These are leopards that were snared in the hill country. I have to thank uh, Anjali and Andrew for the photographs that were given to me. This, the, this, this is another leopard. The wire snare was caught at its neck and a third leopard. And this is happening increasingly more frequently. And uh, Anjali and Andrew is working with the local community and the wildlife department to try to address this problem by raising community awareness. Their target is not really the leopards in most instances. They are targeting wild boar. Unfortunately, when the snare is there, a leopard can get caught. And snares are illegal. So that is something that we need to address. Then looking at wildlife tourism. Sri Lanka has the potential to be the best wildlife tourism destination outside Africa. But to achieve that target, our focus cannot be the number of tourists, but rather the quality of the experience. Unfortunately, our focus is the number of tourists. We have huge over-visitation problems, but when you actually look at it, you have major over-visitation problems in three parks. In Yala, Mineria and Horton Plains. We, we have major problems. Then Vilpattu, Udavalave, Yala Block 5 and Kaudulla are fast becoming a problem that can be arrested right now. But in the other parks, it is not such a serious problem. In uh, 2010, the Colombo University, in preparation of, for the World Bank Ecosystem Conservation Project, the World Bank funded a study done by Colombo University on visitor satisfaction and visitor experience in national parks. Not only did the survey group talk to visitors, international tourists coming out of parks, but they spoke to tourists who are in the beach hotels as well, who haven't gone to the park. And there was a very revealing thing that emerged from that survey. A vast majority of the tourists that come to Sri Lanka visit a national park only once. They come to Sri Lanka repeated times, but go to a national park only once. Why is that? If the experience was good, they would go again. Obviously, the experience is not good. So we should target on trying to make the experience better rather than the numbers. And this is the experience they get. No wonder they don't want to go. This is in Yala. So how do we manage this? Now, Yala is known for its Jeep driver mafia. And I was told by people, don't try to attack the Yala problem initially, because if you start dealing with the Yala problem, I have a house in Yodavava near Yala, you won't be able to go to your house also. You'll need security, armed security, because these guys are a mafia. But in fairness, I had meetings with the Jeep societies. There are three societies. We had meetings with them. 
the department spoke to them and we explained to them why it is in their interest that they behave themselves because their livelihood will get affected on the long term. We showed them comments made by tourists on websites. And we said that we first wanted to register the number of vehicles to see how many vehicles there were. When we registered, we had 658 vehicles, commercial safari operators. Now, a lot of people told us what you should do is limit it to 150. That's a very easy thing to do. If you limit it to 150, I put, we would have put 500 out of work, Jeep drivers. There is no good economic opportunities around the Yala Katragama Tissa Maharama area. So now these people don't have a livelihood. They know the park very well. They know where the animals are. There is a lucrative bushmeat market in those areas. Most likely they will end up poaching. So you can't rush into reducing the number. You have to do, take a phased approach. We were taking an approach of opening block 3, 4, 5, allowing more vehicles to go there. And when the sightings get better, because the animals there, you have excellent wildlife in blocks 3, 4, 5, but they are not habituated to vehicles. So sighting is a bit difficult. But over a period of about a year, sightings will improve. When that happens, you can start reducing the number. You can put limits on all blocks. So that you still accommodate this 658, but not do it in a way that you overcrowd one block. And we thought the first thing we should do is to enforce the rules to the letter. And I must commend the warden of Yala because he actually did an excellent job of doing that. All I did was tell him, I will cover you politically. That's all I did. He is the one who did it. And those of you who had been to Yala, I know there were lots of problems. We still had a lot of work to do. But there were significant improvements in the behavior of Jeep drivers. And in fact, after I left, the Jeep associations are calling me saying, please enforce the rules. Because we liked it. Our tourists liked it. We have some errant drivers. But when you don't enforce the rules, everybody will be errant again. So they seem to want discipline in the parks. But unfortunately, things are being slowly reversed. It is because there is political interference in the management of the parks. Unless you remove political interference from the management of parks, Yala will always be a mess. Then I would also propose that we start introducing vehicle limits to national parks that are not overcrowded immediately. Because there is no controversy when you do that. Because parks that people are not going that much, you can easily introduce a limit. At least then there is a limit that you can't exceed. While, I, while we couldn't reduce the number of vehicles from 658, we thought we'll put a cap on the 658. So that no new vehicles can be registered. And we put an advertisement in the paper saying that that is so. This morning I got a call from the secretary of one of the Jeep associations who are telling me that now a decision has been made that they are not going to put a cap on it. They are going to allow more vehicles to register. Vehicles means votes. That is what is happening. So, if we really want to achieve the best, be the best, uh, best wildlife tourism destination in Asia, we then should have better guides, better trained guides, and better trained Jeep drivers. Not only in Jeep etiquette, Jeep drivers end up going without trackers because we don't have enough staff in the department. Right to send us trackers. So if we train them on wildlife also, then they will give a better experience to the tourists and the country benefits from it. So we need to do things like that. And our park should be marketed for its individual features. Like Rwanda's management of the mountain gorilla experience. They are doing a fantastic job. There is no way we will get close to that, but at least if we keep that as our target, we might get halfway. So how could we help? All of us who are upset about what is happening in protected areas, when we go to the parks, observe rules without exception. And encourage your friends and colleagues also to do the same. Because sometimes what happens is we violate the rules. If we violate the rules, we are not in a position to tell others not to violate the rules. The penalty imposition in the uh, wildlife department in, in Yala in uh, April, May, June, was effective because there were no exceptions. 
not even for the director general right because i used to go to the park sometimes just to see animals and i had told the department if i step out of line you have to penalize me right so that is how we try to do it and that is what the jeep drivers liked as they told me one day loku kuda samata ekase nitya kriyatmaka kara and that is what is needed so if we do that we can easy now in 2 3 months we made an improvement in yala we had a long way to go but we started so it can be done we should also try to influence large hotel chains that are around protected areas to ensure that the jeep drivers that they hire are disciplined i am sorry to say that many of the large hotel chains don't do this even though there have been people trying to talk to them about it since most of you know the ceos of this hotel chains please put pressure on them because if it it's for their survival as well if the visitation experience is good they will get more tourists on the long term then use your political contacts to ensure that political interference is removed from national parks and its management start name and shame campaigns pressurize them to try not to do the wrong thing and eventually we had to start lobbying for limits on for tourism within to be within the carrying capacity of these national parks if we don't do that this we are the visitors in the park it is the sanctuary of the animals we shouldn't be harassing animals to see them so we need to introduce things like this and i think with the influence that all of us collectively have we can pressurize the government to do these things let's look at a few issues on elephant conservation and hcc management i don't want to go a lot into that i think dr prithviraj has given plenty of presentations to you i'm just going to highlight a few things planning of development projects don't take elephant ranging patterns into account we think we can drive the elephants away and then do our development project we are supposed to be the most evolved species we are expecting an elephant to work around us isn't it much easier for us to work around the elephant we are supposed to be analytical in thinking but we are expecting the animal to be analytical in thinking and for us to do what we want so all development projects have to take into account elephant rangers and compensate for that now the dots here are called radio collared elephants their data the airport is the mathalaya airport long before the mathalaya airport was constructed dr prithviraj fernando and his team showed this to the government saying that it is crazy to put an airport in the middle of that it's elephant country right but that happened as well but the more important thing i am trying to show in this slide is the black border that goes around we are trying the trying to pressurize the government to declare that area as a managed elephant range and in fairness to this government even the prime minister decided that there will be no development inside the mer right so this managed elephant range was identified through science not where a politician or i or somebody else felt where the fence should be by collaring elephants looking at their ranging patterns without the black line the ranging patterns are where the dots are so you put the fence around the ranging pattern it doesn't then there is a much greater chance of the elephants not breaking the fence and coming out because that's within their home range the government's other two uh mitigation measures for hcc human elephant conflict is translocations and drives again ccr scientific data clearly shows translocations don't work of the studied translocated elephants 42% died elephant drives don't work populations die because you are putting elephants into a protected area a national park that has reached its carrying capacity of elephants even before the drive began and it's like the slide on the right side it's a bit of an exaggeration that that is what happens you put so many elephants into that there is not food not enough food for anybody the entire population is in jeopardy on the side on the side with the mother and calf it's electric fences put separating the home range 
of animals. This is in Yala, the boundary of Yala. The surrounding land is forest department land. Elephants have a right to be there. By putting the fence, you are reducing the dry season home range and you can see the ribs showing on these elephants. So we are, by doing drives and translocations, we are jeopardizing the conservation future of these animals. Okay, we can think, okay, let's jeopardize the conservation future of these animals, at least it will stop the conflict. All surveys that have been done in drive areas have clearly shown that it does not stop the conflict. Because we are driving the wrong elephants, we are driving the herds. The males don't get driven. They very nicely avoid the drive and they are, they are, they are the ones who create the problem. So we have jeopardized the future of the elephants, not solved the problem. And in fact the remaining elephants become more aggressive, creating a bigger problem for the community in that area. So, the work that has been done by Dr. Prithviraj Fernando and his team show very clearly what is needed now is not fencing for us. Fence villages. Because why are you putting a fence? To protect people from elephants. So why put it in the middle of the forest, between forest department and wildlife department land? Put it around the village. They have done some excellent models in Galgamur, 15 villages, where the community is involved in erecting and maintaining the fence. The community even contributes money for the fence. So it's a very successful model. I visited that and I found that the people are extremely happy. I know Prutu and I am friends, so I didn't ask him what he thinks, I asked the people. And the people said that this model works and it works well. Right? The DWC finally decided, yes, we are also going to do some electric fences around the villages. In February, just before I accepted the position, was the foundation laying stone of the first village fence. After the ceremony was over, interacting with the community, the community told the political leadership, there are about 30 elephants coming into this village. I expected the answer to be, we understand that, that is why we are putting a foundation stone to put a fence around the village. Prutu was witness to that, because he and I were both there. The political leadership looked at the director general at that time and said, Ali Mehayumakaranda, do elephant drive. Okay, the drive never happened, because it was on my watch and we didn't do it. But the fact is now you have told the community in front of everybody that the department has to drive the elephants. So the community puts pressure on the assistant director in that area saying, Minister said do the drive, why are you not doing the drive? Sorry, I planned I will not mention name <laughs> Minister. Anyway, so we have problems like that that we have to deal with. Then we have political interference in the location of the fence. Like I showed you in that other slide, fencers should be located on the boundary of the range of the elephants, not into the range of the elephants. If you go into their home range, they will try to come out. So, we are getting, I, when I was there, we were getting political pressure from various different politicians that the fence should be located 500 meters in from where you are trying to locate it. Why 500 meters? So that the village can ex expand and encroach more into government declared forest reserve. Two ministers wanted me to do this. I refused at first. Then finally I said, okay, I'm willing to do it on one condition. That we sign an agreement between the minister, the wildlife department, saying that we will move the fence, but any future human elephant conflict in that area, that minister and that ministry is responsible for, don't come to wildlife. We are not going to do anything. And I thought this is great, in a couple of years we will have no problem with HEC because the wildlife, the country will have a problem, wildlife won't have a problem because we will not be dealing with it. And in fairness both of them backed off. The agreement is not legally enforceable but you can do a name and shame thing with that. That's why the, the two of them backed off and they didn't put pressure on moving the fence. So we need to start looking at things like that. Commun community should be more responsible. Half the problems are communities being irresponsible. Depending on some, based on some survey that I saw, about 70% of the human beings, male humans who are killed by elephants, happens at night when the male is dead drunk. So you ask him for it. Do you blame the elephant for it? Right? So we should 
first take responsibility for our lives. We can't expect wildlife and others to take responsibility for our stupidity. And I would really like to show you an example of this. This man, there are elephants, he is drunk. Now he is, the elephants are minding their own business. He is provoking the elephants. Right? This is also what uh, Prutu and Jenny had uh, videotaped, not me. So I thank them for giving, sharing it with me. Right? Now, had this man been killed, it's the wildlife departments and the elephants' fault. Right? See, one elephant decides to charge. For, fortunately for the man, the elephant stopped. But this stupid man doesn't learn from this. See, when the elephants go, he's still standing there. Again, he's trying to provoke. Now, this is how many people get killed. They provoke the elephant to do this. This is another thing. This three-wheeler. There are two elephants and the one on the far side is a male in must. Right? If the elephant hit the vehicle, the three-wheeler, it could have killed the inhabitants. And there was a Buddhist monk in there. Can you imagine the mess the wildlife department would have been if the Buddhist monk got killed? Right? And is it the elephant's stupidity or people's stupidity? So we have to really from civil organizations, we have to start working with communities living in elephant areas, trying to convince them that they have to take more responsibility for their life and not what expect the wildlife department or any other department to take care of their problems. So what can we do about it? Work towards increasing community awareness of coexisting with elephants, including the use of indigenous uh, knowledge. I had a very interesting experience with the Ratugala Vaddas once. I had a meeting with the Vadda community, this was about seven or eight years ago. And I asked them about the human elephant conflict and the Vadda chief said, we have no problem. We can coexist with elephants. And he was saying, see, when we are walking in the jungle also, and he did this that they can feel it. And I was wondering, how, how in the world can you feel an elephant long before you see the elephant? Couple of years later, I was reading some research done in Africa on infrasound communication of elephants. The researchers had recorded uh, these uh, communications below human hearing and played back, amplified it and played it back in the lab. While you still don't hear the playback, the pressure goes up in the airwaves and you start feeling it on your body. So the Vaddas are so attuned to nature. Maybe when they are walking in the forest, when elephants are communicating, they can feel it. So there is that knowledge that we can tap into to try to train our communities. Things like that we could do. Explore ways for affected communities to get economic benefits for coexisting. It's really nice for all of us to sit here and say people have to coexist. It is not our house that is being damaged. We are not getting killed. It's not our crops that are being damaged. Communities have to get some economic benefits from coexisting with wildlife. Why should only those local communities suffer? So we have to look at ways of doing it. There are other countries that are doing it. Then we should pressurize government and private sector to work around elephants when designing development projects. And finally, I feel that civil society has a role in conservation, a very important role. Because from my presentation, you would have concluded, I hope, that there is very little hope in expecting the authorities to take care of the problem. We have to pressurize the authorities to take care of the problem. Conservation in Sri Lanka is failing if it continues the way it goes. So I'm calling upon civil society and civil organizations to move beyond the advocacy and watchdog role that we are playing very effectively. But we have to move beyond that. I'm not saying ignore that, but move beyond that. Work with the media to play a role in creating awareness. Channel private sector interests and CSR programs towards conservation outcomes. Lots of companies have money for CSR. And as I say, tell business leaders when I address them, you do random acts of conservation good. Not collectively, you are not making any major change. These are random acts. It's good. But it's time that we try to collectively do something to actually make an impact. Then form partnerships with the Department of Wildlife Conservation. Assist them in dealing with the political pressure because they are unable to do it on their own. So without criticizing the department, I know it's not perfect. 
I know they deserve criticism at times, but I feel now we should try to work with them to try to ensure we can deal with the political pressure. They can't deal with it. But we are civil society, we are outside, we can raise issues with politicians. So we should work with them to do that. And the time is right for CSOs, civil society organizations to drive the conservation agenda in Sri Lanka. And that is what I am appealing from you. And I will end with a quote. The hope of the future lies not in curbing the influence of human occupancy, it is already too late for that, but in creating a better understanding of the extent of that influence and a new ethic for its governance, which is exactly what I am asking you and me, all of us to collectively do. Thank you. Yes. If you see anybody going in the reverse direction, the department should be fining them. Because one way doesn't mean I can go backwards in that way. Right? So, if you actually, if we start enforcing, if the department, I believe that the department should have at least two to, particularly on heavy visitation days, two to three vehicles patrolling the park. As soon as a department vehicle is seen, the jeep drivers behave themselves. Right? We are not doing enough of that. We need to do that. Unfortunately, what happened to the Yala warden is a complete disincentive for others to want to do something good. Because he tells me, Mam Vada Karanda Gilada Mam Karadarivatuni. So it can be done. You have to penalize. You and I won't why, why don't we speed when we are driving? Because we might get stopped by a traffic cop. If there are no traffic cops enforcing, we will speed. So enforcement is the key. Yes. The cabinet decision happened after I left, so I have not read the cabinet paper to begin with. And like I said, if the corridors have been identified correctly and they are, are elephants actually migrate using that corridor, moving the people out will make sense. But I am wondering whether I can put Prutu on the spot to ask him whether he could uh, enlighten us a little bit on that. Because I don't really know whether these corridors uh, have been identified directly. It is political pressure that is forcing the department to do that. In fact, this afternoon with the WNPS, Human Elephant Conflict Subcommittee, we were meeting. This was one of the issues and uh, a small group of the people who were participating are planning on going and meeting some of the politicians who were behind the drive to try to see whether we can convince them otherwise. I, like I said, the department gets forced into it. Okay. Department could stand up and say, no, we are not going to do it. Like I said, if you, if you want, see, what I, when I was there, I stood up to certain things because I, am, I have a World Bank pension, I can afford to get out. Right? So you can't, you have to be fair by government staff. See, it's very difficult when I, it is only when I was in the hot seat that I realized the pressure that the DGs have been going through. It's tremendous pressure they go through. And it is very difficult to refuse to do things when the pressure comes from the politicians. Because you don't know how you will be penalized if you don't do it. So I totally agree. We were discussing it. I think uh, Prutu again has some data. It's 50 to 100 elephants in that area. And once again, we know the drive will fail. We know that the males who are problem elephants will be left behind. It will be the herd that will be driven into the park. And the experience with the Walaway left bank drive, most of the elephants driven into the park died. There's documented data for it. So it's not speculation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good idea. We should start doing things like that. Again, we have to collectively try to put pressure on government to do that. Yes. Yes.
that's a very difficult one to answer right because when dr gunarwan was general manager railways because he and i are quite close friends and i had been talking to him about this issue we actually went in a train on the area that elephants get knocked down and at 35 kilometers an hour when you brake it takes over 100 meters for the train to stop right so by the time you see the elephant it is too late to stop what he was telling me from the railway side was that if you give if the uh, the conservation people can tell us exactly from let's say kilometer 85 to 87 93 to 95 like that areas where you know that the elephants are crossing then you they can try to reduce the speed in those areas right but unless you know that telling them all the way from kakirava to kantale to go slow they say that is not possible and which is fair enough now to be able to figure out these areas the fortunately railway seems to be having a lot of data in their files so we need to get somebody to extract this data and analyze it to see whether there are crossing paths right and then if you know there are places where it crosses then you can either put overpasses or underpasses something like that but until we know what we are doing once again we are groping in the dark and right now we are groping in the dark so i don't really know how to answer that question and it's quite surprising because generally the elephant should feel the train coming with the vibration of it for some reason they are not moving most of the elephants who get killed are females and calves which also could be something maybe the calf is on the line and the mother will never move if the calf is on the line so things like that may be happening i don't know so that needs to be studied a lot i really feel a bit nervous to speculate what could be done i don't know enough information about it uh, one thing uh, we have a lot of environmental organizations in sri lanka yeah well ideally we should all unite because if we are united we are much more of a formidable force with government but if we can't unite that's okay then at least do it independently not doing it is not an option at least independently agree on certain things that you are going to do and pursue it because like i said in fairness this government is receptive to public pressure so let's use it but one person talking about it won't help at least inform the other organizations this is a campaign we are doing you can do it independently but by informing the other organizations then you give them them a chance as well to join that they could do it separately but at least they are conveying the same message so we have to do things like that if we don't we are going to be in trouble the last survey done uh, in sri lanka was done at the time when the minister is someone who is linked to the elephant smuggling mafia so you can imagine what the objective was and uh, several conservation organizations boycotted that survey but the survey went ahead and the final figure for the uh, elephant center to given by the minister and uh, the survey uh, results were uh, fudged to get that figure so that's why you can't go by surveys <laughs> yes I don't know whether there is a conflict between leopard and human because there is no recorded incidence of leopards attacking humans. But sir, the things the rainforest the lions indicates that they are being on the stage. Yeah. The wild boar population, the baki deer population has increased. Yes. The leopards seem to be coming out. The coming out. Correct. They are coming out closer to the human habitation. I agree. no the at least during my 
short period that wildlife when one or two people were injured we looked into what exactly happened for those people to get injured whether the leopard attacked them or they provoked the leopard into attacking them in both instances the leopard was provoked the leopard was minding its own business so one once one fellow had a knife and he tried to stab the leopard with it throw the knife at the leopard the leopard attacked so things like that happen so then you can't say the leopard attacked the people people provoked the leopard to attack yeah Yeah. Never came out. I agree. I'm not saying it is. I agree. I I'm not saying it's not a problem. It is a problem that has to be addressed. But when you say a leopard-human conflict, it gives the impression that humans and leopards are in conflict, clashing. That is not really happening yet. Leopards are coming out to human-habited areas. because of the prey 